I thought we can do better than that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Good evening and God bless you. I trust your day was wonderful. Amen. Well, for those of you I'm seeing for the first time this month, amen. Happy new month. Welcome to the month of March. And for us, this is a month of multiple open doors. I don't think you heard me well. Amen. March will be for you a month of multiple open doors. Amen. Financial doors. Amen. Doors of opportunity. Amen. Doors of greatness. Amen. Doors of lifting and promotion. Amen. Doors of spiritual encounter and revelation. Amen. So doors will open to you on every side. Amen. Come and say better amen. Now, one of the things, our scripture, the anchor scripture for the month is Revelations chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Behold, I set before you an open door. Amen. Before that, it says, I am he who has the keys of David, who opens and no man can shut, and who shuts and no man can open. Then it says, Behold, I set before you an open door. Amen. Which no man can shut. Praise the Lord. So the door is open. Come on, the door is open. Hallelujah. You'll walk right into it. Amen. I say you'll walk into it. Amen. You will experience the blessings, the benefits of open doors. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, when we saw that, we also saw that the same one who said, I have set before you an open door, now goes on to say, I have given you a key. And why will he give me a key if he does not intend me to use it? So we discovered that there is a principle. Amen. That there is a principle. And what is that principle? What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you lose on earth is lost in heaven. So what must open to you in heaven you must open it here on earth so i'm going to give you two minutes to pray like you've not prayed am i communicating hallelujah say behold i give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven whatsoever you bind on it is back whatever you lose is loose so you are going to pray and you are going to decree that this month wherever you turn to doors will open for you are you ready to pray? Come and go ahead and pray. I want to hear you pray. Wherever you turn to, wherever I turn to this month, doors must open to me. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, that was not praying. No. That was muttering. Eh? That was... Have you heard toilet fly? That big one. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Amen. We also saw that it takes the anointing who is the mother of that child? That we came the mother of. It takes the anointing to command open doors. Are we together? We saw one of the instruments, kingdom instruments that facilitates open doors is the anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you are going to pray 
and ask that the anointing that will force your doors to open will come upon you this season. Now this time I want to hear you pray. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, say I receive the anointing for open doors. Go ahead and pray. The anointing that commands open doors. The anointing that makes for open doors. The anointing that will cause my doors to open. I receive that anointing. In the name of Jesus. La coriante in paruskate Lebron to legadia. Thank you, precious Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let that amen be alive. Say the amen because you believe it. Say the amen like thunder. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. Now I'm sure I'm not supposed to be reminding you. But since you don't remember, I will remind you. These are media moments. So I will encourage you, if you have not done already, please connect to our Facebook page, The Refiner's Church. Subscribe, like, share. This service is being streamed live. Praise the Lord. I would love others to join us online so you can share with your friends, share with your colleagues, and those who are watching us, we also encourage that you do likewise. Because we believe that there is something that will be said and done in this service that will be benefit to someone who is not with us physically. Praise the Lord. So please do us a favor and do that. I believe you can also get our messages on YouTube. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Amen. I'm sure some of you are beginning to wonder if I was going to keep you standing throughout. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There's something I would like to share with us. I would like us to discuss together. I want to call it more of a study, more of a Bible study than just preaching. Because it will entail our digging into the scriptures. Our trying to understand certain principles and protocols in the scriptures for the purpose of a title i have used approaching god's presence and from these scriptures i believe it will help us to make the most of being in the presence of god am i communicating come on talk to me am i communicating praise the lord now, for a text, we'll be looking at Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. I'll be reading from verses 1 to 3. I will be reading from the New King James versions. So I will encourage you either follow me in your Bibles or on the screen. Preferably in your Bible. Now, are we there? Are we there? Okay. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. Praise the Lord. I was reading this passage earlier today. Praise the Lord. And as I read God's word, as I read, I became intrigued by particular statements. 
And that statement says, By all, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. So my purpose tonight is for us to gain an understanding of that statement. Am I communicating? For us to discover what the implication of that statement is as it relates to us in the New Testament. Are we together? Because you will agree with me that there is this ongoing debate. You hear people talk about the fact that certain things in the Bible, certain Old Testament scriptures do not apply to the New Testament believer. And since I became caught up and raptured by this statement, I wanted to know if God is speaking to me as a New Testament saint or he was only speaking to the sons of Aaron and the Levites in general. Are we together? So one of the first things that struck me is the fact that scripture says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, of the Holy Spirit. And all scripture is profitable for instruction, for reproof, for correction in righteousness that the man of God may be properly furnished. So is this one of those scriptures that I need to give attention to, that you and I need to give attention to, so that we can be properly furnished, thoroughly equipped in the ways of righteousness. Amen. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Because we need to establish that first and foremost. Are we together? Come on, talk to me. Are we together? Praise the Lord. It will be of no use, no basis in trying to understand the scripture if it does not apply to us. Is that not true? Uh, I'm waiting for response. I say it will be a study, which means I will talk. I will hear from you. Praise the Lord. So am I communicating? Come on, see, I hear you. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 11. The Bible says, now all these things happen to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. So what happened to the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu is an example Hello? It was written down so that we who are New Testament believers can receive what? Instruction. When the teacher is teaching mathematics, you know, subjects that involve calculation, praise the Lord, at some point they will give you what? An example. So that you know how to solve that equation. The Bible says those things that were written down, those events that were written down in the Old Testament were written with purpose in mind. And what is that purpose? To serve as examples for us and then to give us instruction. Are we together? Praise the Lord. I'll read from another translation, the easy-to-read version. The easy-to-read version says, the things that happened to those people are examples. They were written to be warning for us. So the Bible is saying that if calamity could befall the sons of Aaron, remember, anointed priests, People who were certified by God to have unrestrained access into his very presence. If that 
to be for them, God is saying to us, we must be careful lest a similar fate come upon us. Am I communicating? Praise the Lord. So it was written down as a warning for us. We live in the time that all those past histories were pointing to. So we have the fulfillment. They are what we call the shadow. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you with me? I can see your shadows. Is there anybody here who doesn't have a shadow? If you don't have a shadow, then you'll be dead. Now, which is more solid? You or your shadow? Talk to me. Which has more substance? Which has more weight? So, if they lived in the shadow and we have the reality, which one should have more weight? Am I communicating? Because you see, at times we just look at these things, we gloss over, we say those things don't happen again. We need to understand from a scriptural perspective. Praise the Lord. Romans 15 verse 4, For whatever things were written before, we are written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. The Passion Translation. He said, whatever was written beforehand was meant to instruct us in how to live. Let me just stop there. Hello? Hello? So this particular instruction of scripture, this particular example, is saying to us, is written down. It has been put there so that you will know how to what? Live how to approach God's presence. Praise the name of the Lord. So you will agree with me that the question of relevance to the New Testament dispensation or lifestyle does not arise. Are you with me at all tonight? If you are awake, let me see. Be like this. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So does God still kill people for being careless in his presence? The answer is yes. Go and ask Ananias and Sapphira. Amen. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 14 and 15. Paul says, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Praise the Lord. So contrary to what a number of people think, there are instructions, the admonitions on how you are expected to conduct yourself in the presence of God. Amen. The admonitions, their instructions on how the believer is expected to carry himself in the presence of God. Hello. You know, at times when we tell people, it's God's house. Don't just behave anyhow. You know what they say? Is it not church? Are they trying to control somebody how you behave again in church? The Bible says there is a way you ought to behave. Paul had to write specifically to Timothy to admonish his congregation. Telling them there is a way to behave when you come into God's house. 
Ecclesiastes tells us there is a way to behave. <laughs> he said, when you come into the house of God, he said, you should be careful not to talk anyhow. So God's presence is something that should be treated with respect and with regard. Am I talking to someone? Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. So I see this admonition as being for everyone regardless of the covenant dispensation in which that, under which that person is operating. I see it as an admonition for everyone who desires to approach God. Whether in private worship or in public worship. Are we together? Now, we must understand this, especially when we look at the fact that the generation we live in today is a wonderful generation. We are, in the words of Ezekiel, a generation that has no regard for that which is sacred. He says, it's a generation that have violated the law of the Lord and profaned his holy things. A generation that does not distinguish between what is holy and unholy. A generation that has not made a difference between what is clean and unclean. We live in a generation when people say whatever they like, however they like it about the things of the kingdom, about sacred things. Are we together? A generation in which people speak evil of what they don't understand. A generation that speaks evil of dignitaries. A generation that is untaught in the scriptures, but yet they twist the scriptures to their destruction. Are we still together? This is a generation where anybody can wake up and call himself a man of God and take on whatever spiritual, spiritual or ministerial title that he likes. Whereas the scripture says, Hebrews 5 verse 4, he said, no man takes this honor unto himself, but he who was called of God as Aaron. It's a generation that anybody wakes up one day when he has no job and decides that I can open a church after all I can say a few words. You see, it's particularly important because we must understand there are protocols to the things of God. Are we together? And I believe that the disregard that people are having about the things of God is because Permit me to say, charlatans have invaded the things of God. Are we together? You can call yourself a pastor, does not make you one. Oh, yes. If I call myself a woman, will I become one? He said, No man takes this honor unto himself, but he who has been called by God. As Aaron. The Passion Translation says, No one takes this honor upon himself by being self appointed. God says, I did not call these prophets. I did not send them, yet they ran. He said, If I had called them, they would have stood in my council. And if they stood in my council, they would turn these people from their evil ways. We are in a generation where pastors, prophets, apostles, bishops are multiplying. But sin is multiplying. Are we together? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, let me leave that and come back to the issue at hand. Praise the Lord. So, the Bible quotes God as saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. Now, traditionally, God was speaking to those who were qualified to stand in the office 
of ministry. Because those he was speaking to first and foremost were priests, ordained and appointed ministers. But see, in the New Testament, we are all called to be priests and kings. Now, let's understand that now. I keep saying this, everyone must preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every believer must preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But not every believer is called to stand in the fivefold ministry. We must get these things clear. Hallelujah. There is a difference between propagating the gospel and claiming to be called. It's a dangerous thing to claim to be called when God has not called you. Amen. So God spoke initially to those who were called into the office of the priesthood. But looking at it from the New Testament perspective, it applies to all believers. Are we together? Praise the Lord. So, let's begin on this note that is dealing with the subject matter thoroughly. I would like you to take note of that word, must. Amen. God said, by those who come near me, I must. In other words, we are dealing with what? An indispensable requirement. We are dealing with an indispensable demand. We are dealing with something that cannot be sidelined or sidetracked. Are we together? We are saying anyone who wants to seek God and find God, this is what a must. Anyone who wants to pray and know that he has met God, this is a must. Are we together? Now, can I say something at this point? You're not answering me. Listen. Listen and listen good. Why do we pray? Most of us think that prayer is to get things from God. That is the least expression of prayer. If we follow the principle of scripture, that's the principle of first mention. The principle of first mention simply says that whenever you want to understand something, a provision of scripture, you go to where it first appeared in the Bible. Now, if we follow that principle, then the purpose of prayer is to take hold on God. Am I communicating? The Bible says, I think it's Genesis 5, 24, if I'm correct. You see, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Which means before the day of Enosh, because the person being spoken about was Enosh, the son of Methuselah. Before the days of Enosh, no one had ever prayed by calling the name of the Lord. Hello? Prayer, as we know it, was not existent in the days of Adam. Hello? It was not until the days of Enosh that people began to pray. So what was the difference between the days of Adam and the days of Enosh? Adam did not need to pray to God because God will come to him in the cool of the night. Adam did not need to pray and say, Father in heaven, because Father was not in heaven. Father will come down to Adam and they will have fellowship. Am I communicating? So, prayer is not God's best for man. There is something higher than prayer. Or better still, 
the ultimate design of prayer is to what? Take hold of God. When they no longer had access to God, they began to pray so that they can lay hold on the God they no longer had access to. Am I communicating? So we are saying for anyone who must find God, this is a must. If you are catching what I'm saying, come on, wave your hands, let me see. If you are going to pray, and your prayer is just going to, is going to go beyond, you know, just mere words. Many times we pray with the assurance whether God heard us or whether he spoke to us. So for those who are going to reach out to God, lay hold on God, and have God respond to them, God is saying to us, this is an indispensable requirement. You can't put this aside. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Everyone who will find access or who access will be granted him into the very presence of God, this requirement is indispensable. Are we together? Glory to God. Glory to God. So what is this requirement? What is God demanding what is the demand of heaven? God says, I must be regarded as what? As holy. Amen. Before you can get access to my presence, I must be regarded as what? As holy. Praise the Lord. If that is the requirement, I believe it then behoves us to understand what it means to be holy. We must understand what holiness is and what it means to be holy. Praise the Lord. So can I ask a question? What is holiness? Hmm? Hello? What is holiness? Nobody's going to bail me out. But we keep hearing the word now. Okay. In defining holiness, you must understand that there are two perspectives to holiness. Hello? Hello? Don't let those who are watching me think I'm talking to myself. Amen. Amen. There are what? Two perspectives. First of all, there's holiness as it relates to God. God is, God is, God is, God is. Are we good? Praise the Lord. And then there is holiness as it relates to us, to man. Okay? Okay? Praise the Lord. So God is holy. Holiness is the description of who God is. You can't describe God without the word holy. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3. He said, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Praise the Lord. The truth is, when you check dictionaries, Bible dictionaries, commentaries, there is one conclusion. Holiness can only be adequately defined defined in God. 
Are we together? The only true definition of holiness is God. There are no physical words that could give us a true definition of holiness. So if you really want to know what holiness is, look at God. Amen. So holiness is the quality of who God is. Holiness is an essential element of God's nature and personality. Hello. You know the same way if you truly want to define love, you have to look at God. Praise the Lord. Now, Revelation chapter 15 verse 4. Am I boring you? I'm wondering why you are so, so quiet. I don't like quiet audience. It makes me think you are sleeping while you are awake. Revelation 15 verse 4. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God will bless someone this evening with good things in the name of Jesus. Is that what you are waiting for? Amen. He said, who shall not fear you? O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. For all the nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. I'd like you to see this. The Bible says, God alone is what? Holy. So, holy is an attribute that can only be rightly assigned to God. And I want you to also observe that you can't encounter God's holiness without the fear of the Lord. Amen. Are we together? Praise the Lord. So God alone is what? Holy. I, I, I'm trying to describe, define holiness from the God perspective. Are you working with me? Now listen. God is the perfection of purity. So if you want to define pure, is God. Hello? God is the perfection of purity. The perfection of moral and ethical wholeness. The Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. Habakkuk 1 13. He says your eyes are purer than to behold evil. And cannot look on wickedness. So God is so pure that everything that is unclean or not holy or not right cannot enter his presence. As a matter of fact, if you look at the context of that scripture, anything that is not pure, perfectly pure, upon entering God's presence is consumed. Hello. So you begin to understand why the children of Israel, when they messed up, they died instantly. Are you with me? So you begin to understand why the sons of Aaron could be consumed in God's presence. Habakkuk said, your eyes are pure. They are the purest. And there is no way you will see what is not right. And by nature, instinctively, it will not be judged instantly. Hello. Are we still together? Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. Amplified translation, classic edition. He said, you are purer eyes than to behold evil. And cannot look inactively upon injustice. So once anything that is not clean enter God's presence, is consumed, instantly destroyed. 
I think it's First Timothy six sixteen that says, "She who alone has immortality dwelling in 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 unapproachable light." Now, the light we are talking about is coming from God's purity. So, the radiance, the brilliance, the brightness of God's holiness consumes everything that is not clean. Are we together? Praise the Lord. 1 Timothy 6, 16, Who alone has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. <laughs> Amen. To whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Praise the Lord. So holiness, if you look at the definition of holiness, can there be any man that is holy? Talk to me now. By that definition of holiness from God's perspective, is it possible for a man to be holy? Is it possible for a man to be perfect in purity? So when the Bible talks about God is holy, I want you to have a picture. Praise the Lord. So holiness is an attribute that can only be found in, in God. Holiness as an attribute cannot exist apart from God. Okay? It is not inherent, inherent in man. Now, this is the challenge. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, he said, but as he who called you is holy, you also be what? In all your conduct because it's written be you holy for i am holy so if this is god's holiness who can be holy can anyone be this holy come on talk to me now <laughs> amen praise the lord praise the lord So how can mortal man be free from perfection? Amen. Are you ready to go on? Are you ready to go on? No answer, no continuity. Now, it is important that we understand that we can never ever, ever approach God on the basis of our own holiness or righteousness. Are we together? You say, but wait. The scripture says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we through that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He knew no sin, yet his sin was laid upon Our sin was laid upon him. So that we now became the righteousness of God in Christ. True. What that scripture says in essence is that when we stand before God, God does not look at our own holiness. God looks at Christ's holiness. God does not relate to us on the basis of our holiness. God relates to us on the basis of his holiness. On the basis of Christ's holiness. Now, the Bible does not, even at that, the Bible does not tell us to approach God even with that imputed holiness. I'm going to show you something. But first of all, let's look at the following scriptures. Ephesians 2.18 It says, for through him we have both access by one spirit to the Father. Through him. Who is the him? Jesus. Ephesians 3 verse 12. For through him, sorry, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Hello? 
Hebrews 10 verse 19 and 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by what? The blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Amen. So we only have access to God through Christ. Through the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Are we good? Are we good? Now remember what I said. Even at that, God does not say that all those who come near him should come by holiness. Rather, he says that we are to come how? Showing regard to the fact that he is holy. Because if you understand holiness, nobody will pass. So he does not place a demand that you cannot. He didn't say come as holy. But he says he who must approach me must give due regard to the fact that I am holy. And there are two different things. And that's why you can mess up and still approach it. But you need to understand. Amen. What that means. So, let's look at the good news. I hope I'm communicating. You sure about that? Praise the Lord. Or you don't like what I'm preaching? The issue is when people are hungry, you hear noise. Have you seen somebody who is hungry and eating and there's no sound? If you're hungry, you're hungry, you're hungry, you're hungry. But when they are not hungry, that's the time they're like this. Hallelujah. Now, good news. Leviticus 10, verse 6. Verse 3, sorry. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord was speaking about when he said, all who serve me must what? Oh, must do what? I thought you were following me. Must respect my holiness. So what's the difference? What's the, what's the difference? What's the difference between coming, bearing holiness, and respecting the fact that God is holy? Now, I told you, holiness can only be understood from two perspectives. There's the divine perspective and then there is the human perspective as demanded by God. So when you look at what holiness is or the definition of holiness from, you know, from the human perspective, you understand. Now, I hope you understand that there's a difference between righteousness and holiness. Huh? You can be right but not holy. But you cannot be holy and not righteous. What Jesus did for us makes us righteous. And what is righteousness? Living up to the divine standard. Measuring up to the divine standard. Are we together? So Jesus fulfilled the entirety of the law on our behalf. So we are able to stand as people who have fulfilled the entirety of the law even though we didn't fulfill it personally. Now, what is holiness? Amen. From a human perspective, holiness means consecration. From the divine perspective, what does it mean? 
perfection the highest standard of purity but from the human perspective what does it mean consecration sanctification If you read the King James Version, it says, I must be sanctified. Now, the word to be sanctified means to what? Be set apart for divine use. Hello. I believe somebody's beginning to get to where he's going to. Praise the Lord. To be consecrated, to be set apart. Now, this, church, this building, this church, we call it a church, right? It has been consecrated. It has been set apart. As long as I'm the pastor, you can never have a party here. I don't care who you are. Why? It has been set apart for divine use. But you know we can sell this building. What makes it a church is not the style or the shape of the building. This can be an event center. We can use it for football viewing, viewing center. We can use it for weddings, to make a wonderful wedding. Eh? We can have shows here. But what makes it a church is that we have set it apart for God's use. So we say it cannot be used by anything other than God. So when we say a child of God is holy or consecrated, or set apart we are saying that child's life that child of God his life is only to be used by God are we together now the Bible says by all those who will come near me they must respect the fact that I'm holy enough to consecrate themselves before they approach me So let me break it down. It means that when I come into God's presence, for example, for a time of prayer, that time must be consecrated to him alone. Nothing else must touch me or touch my life or touch my mind within that time frame. If I must see God, if I must meet God, if I must encounter God, then I must not forget that I'm coming to meet a holy God and then I must consecrate myself, set myself apart to say for that time I am with God is God alone. When I come to meet him in the sanctuary, I'm coming for him and him alone. When I pick up my phone in the middle of prayer, I'm not regarding him as holy. When I browse with my phone during prayer or maybe in service like this because I'm using it I am not regarding him as holy. I have not set myself apart. I have not set my time apart to meet with him. Has God spoken to someone? Is it clear now? Rise to your feet.
How many of you understood? If you got it clear, let me see. It. Let me see. It. So that you don't pray what you are not pray, what you don't know you are praying. Is it clear? Eh? Praise the Lord. You are going to ask the Lord to give you grace. To always approach him as God. You know, even though the blood of Jesus has presented us righteous before him, we are the only ones who can set ourselves apart. So even though you are blameless, faultless, you are still not holy. And you know what the scripture says? Follow peace with all men. And what? Holiness. Without which no man will see the Lord. So you are not granted divine audience on the basis of righteousness, but on the basis of holiness. It's the understanding that God is holy. That every time I look God word, it must be the only one and the only thing in my radar. So we are going to talk to God to give us grace. Grace to approach him in holiness. Grace to be able to make the most of being in his presence. Can we go ahead and talk to him? I want to hear you pray. Lord, give me grace to respect the fact that I'm approaching a God that is holy. To be conscious of the fact that I'm before a holy God. That I stand before the presence of a holy God. Lord, give me the grace. Lord, give me the grace. In Jesus' name. Now, look at me, look at me. Honestly, how many of us understand this? Let me see you. Okay, let me show you something. 
Maybe you'll help us pray better. How many of us remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Acts chapter 5, I'll just read a few portions. He said, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part, keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Why it remained? Was it not in your control? In your own control. Sorry, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You see, you have not lied to men but to God. Now, let me ask you a few questions. Praise the Lord. Was Ananias born again? Answer me, was Ananias born again? Very born again. Was Ananias righteous? He was the righteousness of God in Christ. While Ananias was lying to Peter or telling the lies, was he righteous? Huh? Huh? No, he was righteous. His actions cannot change his righteousness. Because it is not him. It is what Christ has done. But was he holy? Can I show you the evidence of his lack of holiness? Peter said, why has Satan filled your heart, Ananias, to lie to who? He thought he was telling lies to Peter. He was not conscious of the fact that he was standing before a holy God who cannot see iniquity. See, God says, when you come before me, never forget who you are standing before. Be conscious of who you are standing before. So be careful not to be careless in my presence. So he was righteous, he was the righteousness of God in Christ, even while he was lying, he was still the righteousness of God in Christ. But he lost one vital fact. He forgot that it is God. Hello. He didn't approach respecting, regarding God's holiness. He was not conscious of the fact that this is God, just like many of us are. And he paid dearly. Lord, help me. And every time I come into your presence, whether in private prayer or public worship, help me never lose sight of the fact that I stand before a holy God. Help me to be sensible enough to set myself apart, to consecrate myself, to be conscious of the fact that the God before whom I stand is holy. Can we go ahead and talk to him? I can hear you. Help. Right. Help me never lose sight of this fact. That you are holy. That you are the perfection of holiness. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. 
in case you are wondering, that being the case, why are people not dying today? See, God has not changed them. <laughs> Hello? God has not changed and will never change. He says, I am the Lord. I do not change. People died in the Old Testament when they messed up in God's presence. True or false? Ananas and Sapphira died in God's presence. So what's the difference? I'll tell you. If you are a student of the scriptures, you will discover that it got to a point Israel was committing sin and nothing happened to them. Hello? Why? God said in Genesis, He said, My spirit will no longer strive with man seeing that he has become all flesh and that every imagination in his heart is evil. So naturally, when sin begins to multiply, God walks away. So what appears to be tolerance from God is far from tolerance. It's Ikapod. The glory has departed. So God walks away because if he remains, it will be corpses. So he walked away, it became so bad that he was away, in short, it was as if God no longer existed until Jesus came again on the sea. And the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came down. The glory of God was restored. And man misbehaved again. And we saw the first time when Anas of Sapphira. If you go through church history, I won't be surprised that Anas and Sapphira were not the first, only ones to die. As men began to sin and continue sinning, God did what he would normally do. He walked away. So believe it or not, God is not with us like he should be with us. Are you with me? But he will come back. He's coming for a glorious, a church filled with the glory of God. And if we will start giving regard to the fact that he's a holy God. If we start respecting the fact that he's a holy God and accord ourselves in like manner, he will come back powerfully. What is now happening in church is that it's gotten so bad that we cannot muster even a fickle, no, a tiny bit of God's presence to do what He ought to do. That we are now resorting to charms and gimmicks. But God is looking for a generation. God is looking for a, a group of believers. Who will bring his presence back to the end? Who will carry his glory? Who, wherever they go, heaven goes with them? Are you going to be part of that generation? I can hear you. Are we going to be part of that generation? It will start in our place of prayer. It will start when we come to church with the consciousness that this is his house.
that will maintain that consciousness that this is his house that will give him the respect the regard that he ought to have and hear me when we start doing that you will see God in ways you have never imagined before may the Lord bless you and may grace be imparted to you in the name of Jesus hallelujah Hallelujah. Are there titles in the house? If you're in your house with your tight, please come forward. And if you're online watching us, you can also send your tight to the church account. It's already on the screen. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Father, I have brought my tithe in accordance to your word into the storehouse. Bless me as you have promised with open heavens. Blessing such that there will not be room enough to contain bars that are filled to overflow and that that brings over everything that sponsors waste and destruction of my increase and prosperity are rebuked nothing is permitted to temper with my words my investment will not fail to yield and all nations will call me blessed in Jesus name as your declare, so shall it be in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Please let's package our offerings. Package a quality offerings that is worthy to give to a king. Package a good offering that you know is worthy for a king tonight. Let's be on our feet as we take our offering. If you're watching us online, you can also send your offering to the church account that is on the screen. Hallelujah. Let's be on our feet as we take our offering. We don't sit in this house taking our offering. Let's be on our feet as we take our faith declaration. Father, I have come to honor you with my offering as part of my covenant obligation I confess today that I love my king and I have brought you an offering in demonstration of that love 